We graduated to order stuff. Um, somehow I scraped through school, followed the crowd to college. After one year in college, I knew that this was not my scene. I don't like books. I want to do something with my hands. And I was pretty much inspired by the fashion scene of the 60s. Very interesting. My mom and aunties and sister would all get very excited, go shopping, buy fabrics, buttons, ribbons, the works. And then on a appointed day, Minin, the tailor from Salikam, would come on his bicycle. And one room in the house was converted into a studio. And then Minin would be sitting on the floor, cutting, sewing on his little hand machine and turn out beautiful outfits. That was my first exposure to fashion. And as a young kid, I got very involved in what was happening. I started going with mom shopping and looking through books and mm -hmm. suggesting what to do with the fabrics. And uh, they realized that I had a flair and I became their unofficial fashion consultant. <laughs> so, when I decided that I'm not going to continue with academics, and I decided I'm going to become a tailor. Now, the tough part was coming and telling my folks at home that I don't want to go to college, I want to become a tailor. And that created a bit of a scandal in the village actually. But I was adamant, my dad saw that and finally said, okay, I went off to Bombay and I became a tailor. Uh, I finished a one year course in six months, came back and started working as a tailor. In the meantime, my drug problem was progressing and by the time I was like maybe in my early 20s I was declared a hardcore heroin junkie. I knew that I would have to stop but I couldn't. I tried everything I possibly could think of. Hospitals, environmental changes, moving out of Goa, changing friends, changing jobs. But invariably within 10-15 days I would be back to square one. And finally even the doctors and all gave up hope and they assured me that I was not going to live to be 30. I too gave up hope actually. But when I was uh, 27, the First rehab center started in Bombay and they opened a branch here in TV. So I joined immediately considering that this was my only hope. Either I sober up or I die. So I joined the center and within three months I was offered an opportunity to work in the center. I grabbed it. They sent me to Bombay, I went back to college, I went to St. Xavier's, studied there and became a clinical counselor. Came back to Goa and took over the running of the rehab center and uh, yeah, I worked as the director of the center. Got married, got a child. And then decided that now it is time for me to move out. And my wife who was also a seamstress, we got together and we got back into business, started the tailoring business, which did very well, flourished. But uh, I had 
a passion for footwear. So, at that time, there were just about three or four styles of shoes available for men. And I wanted something new, something different, so I decided to experiment and make my own shoes. So after a lot of trial and error, I finally managed to make one pair that worked well. And I proudly wore it everywhere I went. I then bumped into a guy called Francisco Martins, who was getting together a float to go for the Asians, in, this was in 81. So he saw my shoes and he asked me if I could make for him. Now, at that time, I knew nothing about shoemaking. But I said, yes, I'll make shoes. And he placed an order for 600 pairs. I very bravely accepted the order, again, without knowing anything about shoemaking. I got together a few craftsmen, I sat with them, <coughs> within about three weeks we executed the order and that is how I started learning the actual methods of shoemaking. After that shoemaking remained a hobby, I would make for myself, for friends and just for fun until I bumped into Wendell Rodericks at an event and uh, he was quite excited when he came over and saw what I was doing and he decided to host an uh, exhibition of my work in his uh, newly opened salon in Panjim. So there I made my first collection and at that time I was working only with fabrics. I didn't know how to work with leather. So we made a collection with using silks and cottons and jutes and stuff. And it was an immediate hit. <coughs> Press loved my work. People loved my work. Orders started pouring in. So gradually I left the tailoring business to, for my wife to handle and I started making shoes. So, I'm a shoe designer by default. I never thought I would be a shoe designer. Um, being associated with Wendell sort of helped bring my work to the limelight. And uh, I am basically quite a shy guy. I don't like to push myself forward. I am more of a behind-the-scenes man. But my products went places, was noticed. So there were a lot of write-ups, articles. There was a Italian filmmaker who decided to make a documentary which uh, she called The Barefoot Shoemaker. The name came from a book that I had come across called The Barefoot Counselor. And that was about how you can be a counselor without really being educated and trained. And that was the idea. So here I was a shoemaker who had not been trained and just evolved. So, actually now I'd like to take a little break from here because we, I brought, prepared and brought some stuff here. And uh, we'd like to make a pair of slippers with uh, the help of my son. But before that, I would just like to say that, you know, I am driven by passion. I am here because I have always followed my heart and I think it's a beautiful experience. I also think of the doctor 
was a good doctor. He hung up his stethoscope, picked up the paintbrush, and today we have this fantastic space mock talking about Dr. Subodh. We have another guy in our midst who worked his whole life as a banker. He retired as a manager in State Bank of India. And normally a banker when he retires would get into finance or something to do with money. But this guy decided to be naughty. He started tying knots and he taught himself and became an expert in uh, macrame. So I would like to introduce you to Ambrose. Ambrose, will you please let us know who you are? And uh, a round of applause for Ambrose. Thank you. So I met Ambrose a couple of years ago. And I loved his story more than what he was doing. And what he was doing was also fantastic. So we have been talking about doing a collaboration. And uh, I'm happy to say that today we are going to launch that collaboration. So Amros has made these uh, beautiful straps from uh, Jute. Jute. And uh, we will use these straps to make the upper of the slipper. Now the shoe basically is made in three parts. So we have the upper, then we have the insole. Now for the insole, I use a material called leatherboard, which is actually a mixture of leather and cardboard. Most of it is recycled. And I have covered the insole with hemp, which I was lucky to find. And for the sole, we are going to use a rubber that is a recycled rubber. So this material, both the leather board and the rubber, we comes in big sheets and then we cut it according to the shape and design that we use. I will now <coughs> request my son Aaron to come and help. <coughs> and while we are doing that, I'd be happy if you have any questions, any comments, anything to share out of the blue, please. So, so this is the last on which the shoe is basically put together. So the first step is that we fix the insole to the last. Do I really need to hold this mic? No. no. Excuse me. Excuse me.
been exposed to this work since he was a baby. Um, I remember once I was sitting on the floor and doing whatever I was doing. And he was pottering around. And when I looked around, I realized that he was making himself a pair of slippers. And the four-year-old guy, he made himself the first pair of slippers where he used cardboard and paper. And Uh, Janota shoes again. Are you coming um, back to doing that? Uh, actually, personally, for me, I have once again got yeah, the bit that you missed was my little bit of story with yeah. drug addiction and rehabilitation. So, what actually happened was that. I was forced to close down my business a few years ago because there were no more craftsmen. Now that is a big problem that we are facing and uh, I tried bringing craftsmen from outside Goa. It was not too practical because see we are importing, bringing in almost all the material from outside to bring in the laborers also from outside was not economically viable and was too problematic. So basically I stopped working and I got back into rehabilitation. I joined a rehab center in uh, Lonavla and I worked there until lockdown happened. Then the center closed and we relocated to Goa and I'm still involved with the rehabilitation. But in the meantime my son took it upon himself to revive the business. So he has set up a little production unit in Mumbai. So he has the shoes made in Mumbai and so, so Janata is still operating Good to know. differently. Also assisting him, and so he's looking after the business. Though he has, he's doing it a little more quietly than I was doing it. So the shop is not open all the time. He opens only on he sees clients on appointment, and uh, they are supplying to a few other stores. Thank you. 
Dr. May, in fact, I was very much interested in this North, and I don't know who taught me. It, uh, it was in the 70s that someone taught me a lot of this North. I mastered those North, but then during the 70s, there was a big problem of getting chords. The only chords that were available were Juke, mm -hmm. and there was another very sharp, at least sharp on the hands. People used to make bags during that time. And I found both these chords were not suitable for my working because I was very allergic to jute. And the other one used to cut my hands and it was a terrible mess. So that activity was suspended. But then suddenly in my last year of banking, I used to visit Pune. And there my cash officer happened to be uh, was, my cash officer at another branch was, happened, happened to be in Pune and he was very close to me. So one day he invited me over. And the first thing I saw was a macrame hammock from his... Um, and then all these things got into my mind. And that chord was called something quite different. I had never done macrame after that. I had not. In fact, I started with a big project. Maybe that was the mistake I made. I was very fond of him. Now if I see that sling bag. Always I had a sling bag right from school days, always, and I said I'll make a beautiful thing. I still remember the pattern which I was working on. I think four or five rows I made, and then I was so sick. I don't, at that time I was not, but very sick. I could not complete that job. Not, not audible? I couldn't complete that job. And I carried it on, even four or five years after marriage proceed with me and every time I used to try, I used to get an attack, very severe cold. But after I, they say, now I find I am not allergic at all. In fact, the work was of jute. And most of the things I do with jute, Ganpatis and things like that, I make of jute. But I am not allergic. But then, when I went to this Pune, I think, immediately I started working on pot hangers. I didn't know anything much of pot hangers, but then I knew the basic knots. So from there, I. My first thing was starting pot hangers and different things. I went on to different types of knots and different, uh, different like bracelets, earrings, and I went on. And my uh, handicap was an advantage because during that time uh, we started the Made in Saligao market, which gave me an opportunity to develop this heavy hobby further because I was totally restricted to the house, no no activity at all, I, I couldn't get out of the house. And with the YouTube and various uh, channels, I could further develop this hobby of mine. And I love that hobby. And now, uh, Mr. Edmund Pinto has given me another direction to this hobby. I hope we will <laughs> do something on this also. Thank you. Thank you. Now what we have been doing actually is that we are applying the glue. Nice. This is a rubber based solution and uh, after applying it, we, it needs to dry. It's only, if we put it together before it dries, it doesn't hold too well. So we just nailed the insole to the last temporarily. Now we are going to so, and Aaron has applied glue onto the whole insole. So after it dries a little bit, we will fit the <coughs> straps onto the insole and then fit the sole. So, this is basically the procedure. Edwin, in this uh, amazing enterprise which you set up and which was well appreciated, what was the toughest part of the job while putting it together? Was it... Uh, getting uh, attention, you know, getting acceptability or the labor as you mentioned or what exactly? See, credit, credit from the banks? You know, or? I think one of the reasons that a lot of people who may have the skill, the talent, do not want to get into this field is because shoemaking is associated with the caste system. Hmm. The craftsmen come from <coughs> the lowest caste. I remember when I was a kid, 
we had a woman from the shoemaker community who was coming to do the housework. My grandmom did not allow her to enter from the front door. She had to come in from the back door. And I think as a society, we have been very unfair with this community. And that is one of, that is the main reason <coughs> where none of the younger people want to get involved with this line of work because of the caste system. Now, that again for me was quite an issue because coming from a upper middle class family and sitting down and doing this type of work, the family was not happy. But I'm glad <laughs> that I stuck with it and I believe that by doing that, uh, Frederick, I have been able to elevate and give a little bit of prestige to this work. Um, actually, there's another issue that Nilankur is quite interested in. And that is, you see, all my craftsmen were senior citizens. Their sons worked in banks and government offices and whatever. So, one way to solve the problem of <coughs> craftsmen was to develop craftsmen, to train people. And I have been attempting to do that at many levels. So, <coughs> when I was in the rehab center, I trained a few <coughs> of the recovering addicts. We set up a little unit and we did make shoes for a while. More recently, I attempted to take this project to the prison. So I met with the prison authorities. The response was lukewarm. But still I went ahead, I pushed it. They gave me five inmates <coughs> who I attempted to train. Out of them, two, three of them were very eager, very committed. But uh, unfortunately, we couldn't work out the logistics, mainly because the authorities were not really interested in it. So after doing it for, I think, for over six months, the other thing that happened is that the guys who were really interested got released. Good for them. <laughs> but then I would have to start training all over again. Now, training was something that I had been doing even when we were doing the tailoring business because uh, we never employed professional tra uh, tailors. We took in apprentices, we took in young girls, trained them, and that way we were able to get the finish and quality that we wanted. But then again, these girls would like after a couple of years want to leave for better prospects or to get married or whatever. And then I found that we were constantly training, constantly teaching, which is okay. I mean, I quite enjoy it and uh, enjoy it also because it is a service that we provide, which besides monetary, it brings us a lot of satisfaction. Sure, Anything else? Anyone? I have a question for Ambrose. 
Agname, crochet, all of that is considered feminine activity or feminine hobbies. I have a friend who, a gentleman friend who used to hide his crochet. So embarrassed the people would, aunties would come and say, that a boy, why are you doing crochet? So did you also face something like that? No, in fact, I didn't have much of a problem. In fact, uh, what happened was, when I was not well, someone who started the make it, Made in Thalega market happened to be there and she was all praises for that, you can frame it, you can do this, and I was really, really taken up. And then, okay, we said yes, well, and I went with her to, for the first meeting of the uh, diploma called Made in Thalega, but the first ever uh, preliminary this thing where we should, thought of starting a market, but then I didn't find anything like, in fact I enjoyed the thing, but then no one said anything like they appreciated things like that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. But uh, I, I agree, it takes a certain amount of courage to break this taboo, because even for me when I got into dressmaking, <laughs> tailoring, that was considered a girl's job, it's a feminine job. And uh, in fact, because I got into it, there were questions about my sexuality. <laughs> but uh, it didn't bother me because, like I said, I go by my... There were a lot of reasons why I shouldn't be doing what I am doing, but my heart told me that this is what I but Edwin, the class caste thing is also about money. See, because on the one hand, there is no social status. And very often, these pro professions have traditionally been low paying, not now. But then, if there's money in the field, even a guy on will make the best of shoes. You know, so, so, so it's a double whammy. If you're not getting status as well as money, then it's a double whammy. But it could be broken. Yeah. But now, if you <coughs> see, you know, the handmade products mm. are being valued and people are willing to pay good money for them compared to the mass produced factory made mm. stuff. So as a craftsman I think one can earn a substantial amount compared to what it was in those days. So even monetarily I think now for example my men who work with me they told us that never in their lives have they been able to afford the lifestyle that they can afford now. Because our shoes were handmade, our shoes were special and people were willing to pay the price which then helped them to elevate their lifestyle. Some individuals have made a big difference, like Wendell, who is no longer with us, would always promote go and go and go and things. Yeah, yeah. I think he made a big difference for Coco Franco's uh, coconut crafts also, and Coco always credits him for that. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, that vision was there, and I no, think we same, need to remember. Same with me. I owe a lot of my, I mean, most of my success to Wendell, because he has gone out of his way to promote me. Hmm assist in everything I did. And if it was not for him, I probably would have just done, this would have still been a hobby and I would not have been able to take it to where I did. Who suggested the name? It, it just happened organically, Frederick. I don't know really where it came nice from. Nice name, nice. Yeah, I, I, I think my mom had something. I see. Would you be willing to talk about the design sensibility of the shoes that you craft? Um, see, for me it's a little difficult to talk about these things because I'm not a studied designer. So I don't really know the theory and how to teach. Because And also if you see my work is absolutely non-conventional. And one of the advantages <coughs> I believe I have is just like Ambrose says that his handicap is his advantage. Mm. For me, my advantage is the fact that I have no formal training. 
So I'm not bound by any rule. Now, if I go to a, you go to a regular shoemaker and you tell him you want to make a pair of slippers with jute, hmm. that Ambrose will make the straps and give it to you. It's a rough. Will not happen. But for us who don't have the training, we are willing to uh, experiment and to do go. Uh, let me put it this way: we have no boundaries. So I use lot of different materials in my footwear besides like I said I started using leather rather late so I was using fabrics cotton silks and uh, I've used like you know a slice of a bamboo for a heel just a bamboo, I did nothing with it, I just cut it and fit it. And it worked out beautifully. <coughs> Little bit of varnish, super. <coughs> I've used the bark of the um, banana tree. If you see the uh, <coughs> our local onions that you get in Mapsa, they are tied in a bunch and we hang them up. So I found out what, what was the material that they were tying it to. Then it came to the, the strands of the bark in the banana tree. So I said, if you can, we can tie onions, a bunch of onions, we can make shoes. So I used that and make shoes. So in terms of design, it's like no limit, no structure. This guy is the limit. Now I am, in my work, inspired <coughs> quite a lot by nature on the one hand so that's why we have the slippers that we call the tentacles and the leaves and what not and I'm also inspired by fantasy fairy tales pixies elves um, actually, I am not a very methodical person, so I mean, I could have done it better. But now I think Aaron is trying to go back in time and... Okay. I think uh, cloth and I, I think that was the first bit of collaboration we did. Yeah. Where we when when did some beautiful Florentine stitchery. Yeah, the, the embroidery. Yeah. Using different colours, very, very beautiful. And uh, yeah, yeah, then we used that and made uh, okay, slippers for slippers. Yeah, my mother and my mother in law. Yeah. That's right. We used to do also the ninja shoes at that time. That's when. Yes. yes. So then was. I said, "Would you do this? I want to gift it to them for Christmas." And that was the first, you know, slippers you made. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I remember. Yeah.
That's uh, Sheena, I'll put your hand up at least. <laughs> I also like staying behind the scenes. Sorry? I also like staying behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she, Sheena's works are available at the Saligaon market and uh, online. Um, yeah. Yes. So the next pair of slippers will probably be in collaboration with <laughs> The tools that you use, did you have to modify them? Are they standard? The tools? Are they standard cobblers uh, tools? Uh, yes and no. For example, this is basically a tailor scissor. <coughs> this is a carpenter's hammer. Yeah. Um, this is a paper cutter. But uh, this is uh, the traditional tool where you use for cutting leather. Then the hammer is the the, the, these are the pounders that are used for. Hmm. They are customized or they are the standard? No, these are the standard. This is some of the work that Sheena has done. So the next time we do, we probably will use some crochet straps. Crochet is one of the traditional arts of art forms of Goa, no? Supposed to be. We like Sheena. So um, yes, because it's been around for so long, but it would have been brought, I believe, by some nuns. I don't know which country they came from. But um, from what I was reading, and I don't know if I'm correct, but I think it may have started in the convent, Santa Monica. Yeah. So the nuns there bring it, the nuns with, what are you Spanish nuns? I don't know. Could it have been Spanish? And uh, yeah, their work was very intricate because it was the fine red lace work. Um, now we are doing lots of other things with the so it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Actually, Frederick, I would like to throw a question to my, throw your question to my daughter-in-law. She's also a psychologist, a teacher, and now she's getting involved with Footwear. So, Debbie, you want to tell us how you feel about getting involved with this work? Um, for someone who is very logical and rational, I think creativity is doesn't come easy to everyone. So, I think uh, for me, it's something very valued because it's not something that can be taught. Not something that you can necessarily mm -hmm. learn unless you have the innate the ability or the innate interest. So for me, I find it fascinating, this whole world of creativity, yeah. and fashion and design, because it's not something that comes easily to me. That's why I have so much respect for it. Thank you. Traditional shoemakers, basically like yogis, they sit on the floor and use their feet as a vice to hold the work. Unfortunately, I can't do it.
kind of stand that has those three? What, what is that? Can you talk about that a little? All? Yeah, that is the anvil. Yeah. It, it's the shoemaker's anvil. It has like three arms. Yes. Which you use for use uh, pounding different parts of the shoe. So it's in a similar way as so, the wooden part you're using here. Yeah, this is the last from which the shoe is built. Okay. So usually what happens is now after the shoe is built, we will take off the last. Yeah. And uh, if it's a closed shoe, then that has one arm which goes mm -hmm. into the shoe and you can pound the front. It has another arm that you can do for the back. So there are different parts of that uh, shoemaker's anvil is used basically for beating down and pounding the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, this, uh, in Mapsa, you know the few mochis that are left, the one in the very back near the juice stand? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on, I think it was Dasera, was it Dasera? When I went to him, he had laid all his tools out and done oh, yes, yes, yes. a puja okay. to it because yes. it was all his tools of the trade. Yes. So he was explaining to me what each of these things do, but I didn't get to that part of that three-section stand, the anvil, as you said. Yeah, actually, the the is a festival that even my uh, workers used to celebrate yeah. because they sort of pay of homage yeah. and respect to the tools of the trade. Correct. And it's, uh, I think, I used to enjoy that yeah, little beautiful. ceremony where they used to clean and polish yeah. and wash and put flowers and yeah, incense. It's beautiful. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, we are done. The cobbler is such an important uh, element of, of our imagination, even in school stories we are ke keeping on reading. But in the last one generation, he has virtually died of died out of the villages, like how this lady said, uh, the few that are left. In our village we had two or three of them, but like no longer there. It's got something to do with the marketing of shoes and the chains that have taken over and repairs are not an issue anymore, I guess. No one repairs shoes or... Yeah. And the few guys who are still repairing shoes are thriving. I see. Because the factory made shoes <laughs> don't last. So you have to keep running to the cobbler to fix them. They charge like doctors, that's also yeah. there. <laughs> Some of them, not all. Especially Panjim. The last guy who worked uh, with me, he retired at the age of 94. Wow. And that too he didn't want to, it's his kids that told him, man, enough 94. But uh, very reluctantly he then he stopped. But with them it was a passion, they just enjoyed doing it. And one of the things that I noticed, the difference between the Goan shoemakers and the guys who came from other states, is that our local shoemakers were very particular about quality. They were not in a hurry to 
complete their work, but it had to be done to perfection. And apparently that is uh, the legacy of the Portuguese. Because most of these shoe, the local shoemakers were trained by the Portuguese, so much so that even the uh, terminology, the tools and all were still called by the Portuguese names. Like that founder was called a Batador. Edwin, to add to that, countries like Uganda have even a permanent, uh, you know, artisan centre where tourists flock to. In spite of so many tourists coming to Goa, there's no such thing. The government has been talking about it for ages, made says or whatever, but it's not happened. I hope it does. Mm. You know, something typical of the place and made with. A lot of markets are opening up in different villages, but they are having a problem with getting a crowd. Okay, so thank you all for coming, for being here, giving us your time. Special thanks to Ambrose for thank you. It was a pleasure working with you and I look forward to doing most of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also have a small token of appreciation from all of us. I request Hita, please to give it to him.